Yeah, thanks, Victor. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lucy uh, from the UK, and I'm also one of the board members for the international movement. And it's my pleasure, pleasure today to introduce Nadia from Push Sweden's International Working Group. And we've also got Marie Claire as well from Youngo, so the children and youth constituency to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And both of these um, people will be speaking on the topics of international climate and educational policies from a youth perspective. So uh, Nadia, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to start right away and share my screen. Um, Okay, um, good morning from Stockholm. Uh, my name is Nadia and I'm going to talk today about the international climate policy from a youth perspective. And um, as Lucy said, I'm part of uh, Sweden, a youth advocacy group for radical and science-based climate policy. And so I've been part of PUSH since um, November 2019 uh, when we went to the climate conference in Madrid and some part of the international group. So it's a lot about, um, yeah, kind of EU, but also UN climate uh, politics. And um, yeah, I'm actually from Vienna, Austria, but I'm currently doing my master's at the Stockholm Resilience Center. And um, yeah, so we already saw this big gap from Will Stefan. So we have this kind of um, gap in ambition between where we ought to be with the Paris Agreement and where the pledges and the current policies are. So I'm going to skip that a bit. Um, but so why is 2020 so important? So the question is, is that the year of climate ambition? Um, because the deadline 2020 is um, that countries should submit their updated climate pledges um, for 2030 by the end of the year because that's a review mechanism uh, within the Paris Agreement that every five years countries should update their, um, yeah, their climate ambition. Um, and it was uh, in the COP26, so the one in Glasgow was uh, supposed to kind of gather a momentum, um, but unfortunately it was postponed due to COVID. So that's a bit of a challenge now to really, um, yeah, so that really countries are pledging uh, and be more ambitious, because as we saw, there is a big gap. Um, so, for example, the EU will decide on its 2030 target by December and, yeah, the discussions of increasing it to 50 to 55 percent, but at least 65 percent is needed to be in line with science. Um, and then there's also still from COP25 other topics that are kind of still open, haven't been like... Uh, yeah, that, that's, for example, the Article 6 on the uh, carbon market. So how will international climate, uh, the international climate community organize uh, carbon trade and carbon offsetting, um, where there could be potential loopholes of like double counting, etc. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a really important year. Um, and so why is now a youth perspective so important um, within international climate policies. So um, these are some uh, images from me from the COP25. And so young people are of course a voice for um, young, but also future generations. So really embodying kind of um, the, the impact on future generations. And many young people shared their experience and their um, kind of yeah, for example, from, from small island states, like how they're really already now impacted by climate change. Um, then a lot of young people are also raising their voice for those who who can't, like don't have a voice at the moment. So um, young people from Latin America were um, remembering and, and, and kind of honoring environmental activists that have been murdered um, due to their activism. And indigenous um, yeah, youth kind of, yeah, pushing for indigenous rights and like a more holistic perspective on like in integrating human rights into the into the negotiations, um, which you might think should be obvious, but no, it's not. Um, and yeah, and then young people have been really been a voice for ambitious climate policies and kind of conveying the urgency. So um, yeah, so we see a photo of Fridays for Future protesting, um, then also young European youth kind of putting pressure on the EU. Um, 
And yes, and young people have been a voice for new agendas and a more critical perspective. So, um, for example, bringing onto the table of that you, we need to include aviation and maritime emissions. So there's a group called Sail to COP. And also kind of, yeah, kind of bringing more critical perspectives of like green growth and kind of still ongoing colonial, post-colonial patterns that are, um, yeah in the negotiation halls. And so how are young people active at the climate conferences? So there are official youth delegates, for example, who are really part of the, of the government delegations, um, some independent, some not. Um, young people are observing the negotiations, talking to delegates, putting pressure on them, um, informing young, other young people what is happening to so kind of breaking down that very technical, very, um, yeah, a bit of intransparent process of, of negotiations and kind of, yeah, posting that on social media and communicating that. Um, and also within Yango, which we'll hear more from Marie Claire, the youth constituency, being youth representatives in different committees and really giving a youth voice there, uh, organizing side events, protests, creative actions. Um, yeah, as I said, we wrote an open letter to the EU statements, press conference. So there are a lot of uh, different ways. Um, but there are also some challenges. Um, so now I talk especially at the climate conferences, but in general also for youth advocacy. So one was kind of this <laughs> maybe new term of youth washing. So like uh, politicians want to have like young people on photos and being like, yeah, this is so important. Like, yes, we hear you, but then it's just empty words. So um, here, for example, Fridays for Future and other young people stormed the stage um, and it was kind of applauded um, when there were a lot of cameras. But outside, they were like outside of this room, other people were protesting and then they got kicked out. So, you know, that's kind of, yeah. And But then, yeah, there's still a problem of not having really a seat on the negotiation table and not really having um, like young people can't veto like a, a bad a proposal, for example. Um, and there's still also unequal representation between Global South and Global North, uh, Global North and Global South youth. So um, yeah, there's like lack of funding, for example, or visa problems. And also the co conferences have mainly been in, in the EU the last four years. So of course, it's like a lot of costs then to go there. Um, and yeah, and then, for example, youth delegate programs where some are still kind of part of the government, but can't really express independently what youth are thinking. And um, yeah, so how can we now bring this, what is happening at the COP kind of closer to home and what's actually what we can do um, at, at our um, kind of where we can influence? Um, so some of my learnings were that kind of, it, it's all about timing. Um, it's so important to really um, push for something when the time is right, when it's actually on the agenda, when there's maybe media attention on it. So as I said, there's this deadline 2020, that's something, um, that's the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. There are those moments in time where there will be like media attention on things. And also it's a mar marathon, not a sprint, like things on, are happening quite slowly, but it's always important to keep like, pressure going on and that we also need a lot of diverse perspectives so um yeah kind of hearing from indigenous youth um and and um yeah that was really like eye-opening um for me and yeah also good to kind of reflect on our own privileges and and um yeah so how can we bring that closer to home so youth advocacy doesn't only happen at the cops but um, yeah, it's possible to do um, youth consultancies, formulate youth demands and visions. So we did that, for example, with the European Green Deal. Their climate students was also part of that. Um, then writing open letters, emails, Twitter storms. So the photo of the Zoom, that's uh, when we wrote and open some letters to, to European MEPs and then talk to politicians after that. Um, then, as I said, kind of, yeah, can combine activism but also with those policy windows so when there's kind of heightened attention onto something and then really combine that with scientific evidence to kind of be most effective and um and also like local climate conferences where you there's a lot of yeah 
time to educate and to actually understand what how this process is how this process is so what are they what what, what is what is on the negotiation table and etc um yeah and I, hear, I think here it's really important to also connect with ongoing campaigns and movements or like the climate action network and um to really bring a youth perspective to those ongoing um kind of campaigns and yeah and here i've just brainstormed some ideas so how can you bring international uh, climate policy to your campus so i think a lot is about educating fellow students on what is happening on a at the international level we invite experts from politics but civil society and um sorry <laughs> And also to connect to researchers, for example, going to the conferences. Also, universities often have badges, so those tickets, so which might be used for, could be used for students. Um, and yeah, connect to other young people involved in climate policy and youth delegates who then kind of, um, um, yeah, but also, for example, organize climate simulation games, which is a really great way to learn more about the climate conferences. And yeah, to kind of get into those nitty gritty details. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, youth consultancies um, to gather young people's opinions. And yeah, where it's like the good thing if you're a campus, you have a lot of young people, you have like the, a lot of opinions and knowledge. And um, yeah, and then for example, it's like to pressure also university leadership and kind of think about those important uh, timings. So that's the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, the deadline 2020, to also pressure them to speak up as they have a lot of power and credibility. And um, yeah, um, I think that was for me. Uh, thank you a lot and keep on fighting. And if you have any questions, please uh, just let me, know, let me know. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nadia. That was a really insightful talk that you gave. And um, the question, the Q&A session will be after Marie Claire's uh, talk. So if you've got any questions, put them in the chat again. Um, but now over to you, Marie Claire, are you ready?